This is Talking Rackheads. Hi, I'm Nigel from The Art of Sound and this is episode 2 of Talking Rackheads. So, shall we start with something quiet, peaceful, gentle, even tranquil? Hmm. Nah, here's something that's likely to blow your socks off, thanks to Andrew Best at Blamsoft. This is the new XFX Wave module from Blamsoft. It's a wavetable synth with more than a few tricks up its sleeve. Let's take a quick look at the basic interface. Here you have the name of the wavetable, in this case Basic Waves. Then we have a real-time oscilloscope display which lets you see exactly what's going on when you're manipulating the waves. Then we have a position knob. This lets you scroll through the positions in the wavetable. Uh, let me turn on the sound and then I'll show you what I mean. So there's a, a basic sine wave. And if I rotate the position knob, we go to a triangle. sawtooth and a square with varying degrees of pulse width. Now the uh, position is um, patchable so I can use an LFO to automatically scroll through the position like this. Okay, then down this area here, we have an octave switch. A semitone switch. and a fine tune that goes up and down about 0.5%. And then we have an overall level control. Over here, we also have uh, some noise we can add. And in the highest position, you get noise only and the waveform is completely silenced. And then in between that, you get a mix of both. Now we come to three knobs that all work together. Spread, density, and detune. Density adds additional oscillators up to eight of them at any one time so by rotating it this is one oscillator this is two this is three four five six seven eight so now there are eight oscillators playing at the same waveform at the same time and because this is a stereo module the sound is being spread across the stereo image. So each oscillator has its own position in the stereo image. And I highly recommend 
if you're not watching this video through really good speakers or headphones, do so so you can really hear what this thing can do. Then finally, you've got the detune, which detunes all of the voices from each other to thicken up the sound. So here's what detune sounds like in stereo with eight voices. the beast when it needs to be. Okay, I'm going to freeze it here. Um, so I'm frozen it as a basic uh, square wave. Now we've also got the harmonic screen which allows you to add any of the fundamental harmonics to the sound. So for example, I want to add the first harmonic second, third, fourth, and I can balance these as I wish. I can also add the negative or odd harmonics to it if I want to. And I can also draw the harmonics just by running my mouse over like this. You see on the oscilloscope, it's showing us the waveform with all those harmonics. To reset the harmonics, just right click on the display and choose Reset Harmonics. And now we're back to the original sound. And again, you can change the density here of the number of voices. You can just have two if you want to. And when you detune, you get a harmony. I'm going to leave it at about three for the moment, three or four. Okay, so that's this side of the interface. And, you know, that's great, lots of things. But as I said, this is a wavetable synth. And so it has a wavetable, or rather, it has 70 wavetables, at least 70, 70. Here they are. You get them by clicking on the name. Here is the basic wavetable. Then we have a PWM wavetable with varying pulse ranges. So for example, 1 to 99, and if I turn on the modulator, right to that point of silence, but not quite there. Just how I like it. And then we have a whole bank of digitals. One, two, six. And these are digital waveforms that sound a bit like this. going to go through all the wavetables, there's too many. I'm just going to pick out some highlights for me. The Xode PWM1.
four of those, and then there's a whole load of tables. Seven of those tables. Then we've got two FMs, a ratio of one to two and a ratio of two to one. some modern ones that are named after various things. Here's the Babel. Lots of different waveforms in this wavetable. Chatter, which I quite like. It's a weird sort of glitchy stuff going on in that. Got a sync wave. We've got a double sign. so on. Lots and lots of way tables. And there are some great ones. Sign harmonics, sign tables, video game sounds, uh, the wave tables from the Viking synth, the VS wave tables, all three of them, and a series of cross tables. And these X tables have got some really interesting effects and things built into them. A lot of way tables to play with. Next, we have the modulation setting on the right-hand side. We've got three modulators. Each have their own post or pre-harmonics. So if you add harmonics, this will process and modulate the sound after the harmonics have been added or in pre-mode before the harmonics. We also have a patch point, an amount here, and an attenuator to attenuate the amount modified. Now, there's a few mods. Um, let me show you. Here's all the different types of modulation settings you can choose from. Frequency mod, phase distortion, ring modulation, hard sync, invert, reverse, decimate, quantize, hard clip, fold back, saturate, just goes on and on. It's even got a Juno setting, which is that sort of Juno chorus sound. And a really wonderful sound that I love, a mod, is the mirror sync, where it syncs from both ends of the waveform together. High pass, low pass filters, phase shifts, even an odd harmonics. Lots of different modulators. 
and you can use any of these up to three of them at the same time so let me just uh, play a sound and I'm going to modulate a couple of things so you can hear what they sound like in real time let's try a hard sync Decimate. Bending it inwards and outwards. And so on. And that's just one modulator, and there are three of them in combination. So you can choose, for example, a mirror sync with a Juno and let's say um, some zoom in to zoom into the waveform and you get something like this So these great little harmonics you can do, which I'll try and show you a little bit of. I'm stepping through them, but if you more through them, you get this. Lots of harmonics. Thank you. 
and then add the mulch to it. This thing screams. Um, it's really amazing. I've had it for a few hours now, and I can tell you now, it's stunning the things you can come up with. I've put together a few little example patches for you to listen to. Some of them made with a slightly earlier version of this, so they don't have the attenuators, which were added later in an update. So there are a few differences in the screen. But the sound is basically the same. And then I've done a couple of new ones. And also I'll be posting up a longer sort of sound demo of it uh, on YouTube. And I'll post a link for that in the section below this video. So what's my overall impressions of it? Well, pretty stunning. There are quite a few features I didn't even cover. Like, for example, it's got an FM input here. So you can FM the whole sound from another oscillator or whatever you like. It's got this sort of deep, rich bass sound to it. I mean, it doesn't break up at low octaves. Really deep and rich, as you'll hear in some of the demos. I've got some fabulous bass sounds out of this and great soaring leads. And they're also in the VS waveforms. You know, pianos, organs, harps guitars they're all there um this is probably going to end up for me replacing one of my all-time favorite modules which was braids um i use braids as my go-to wavetable synth but i'm pretty certain after playing with this for a few hours this is going to supplant that in most of my patches there's a couple of things that i like about braids which the wave can't do but they're small things, and the truth is, this is so much of a variety of waveforms and sounds and modulations and performance stuff with it you can play with. Plus, I love the fact that we've got these multiple oscillators all sounding at the same time, so you can really thicken up the sound. And then the harmonic section really lets you tweak the sounds of the waveforms by adding your own harmonics you can cut out harmonics it's such an easy thing to use and I actually find the interface dead easy it's sort of one of those things that's just intuitive you just play with it and you come up with these incredible sounds um it's pretty darn good i've no idea what the price will be that's to be confirmed I'm thinking that by the time this video comes out on Wednesday, it may already be available, or if not, then it should be available that day or shortly afterwards. For me, I would buy this in a heartbeat. Um, I don't care. It's just one of those things that gives you such a wide palette of sounds that I really want to use in both a modular system and in XF. Uh, X, uh, VCV rack definitely these sort of things are needed and this is probably the best of its type that I've played with um, really really good okay so let's hear a few uh, of the demos I put together some of them are very short only a few seconds some of them are a couple of minutes I'm only going to include maybe six or seven and again I'll post some more up on YouTube and link in the description. Thanks guys.
And there you have it. That's the new Wave module from Blamsoft. And yes, I know that was quite a lengthy piece, but I thought that a module, the quality of Waves, deserved an in-depth look at. So that's what I did. Okay, next up, an introduction to building your dream synthesizer. Welcome to the first in a series of videos that I'll be including each week in Talking Rackheads on how to build your own perfect, wonderful synthesizer. Now, in CBC Rack and also in Modular, a lot of us tend to create these huge monolithic patches that do everything, play all the sounds, do all the random stuff and they are amazing and you can do all of this and it's wonderful but a modular system and in this case VCV rack the basis of it is all about creating a synthesizer and that's what modular was initially all about you could go out and buy a synthesizer for a lot of money and what you, were es what you were in essence doing was buying choices made by someone else as to what your synthesizer would consist of. The type of voice, the type of envelope, the type of filter. And these were all pre-chosen for you and you went out and bought the hardware and it was all locked in place. Modular, when it first originated, the idea was that you could buy or make your own modules and therefore make your own synthesizer based on your own personal preferences and choices. Now with VCV Rack, as many of the plugins are free, you can build the synth of your dreams for basically nothing. And that's amazing. And people sometimes forget that, that that's one of the purposes of a system like VCV Rack. So what I'm going to do in this series is start off from the very basics and by the end of it hopefully I will have built a synth of my dreams and you making your own choices will make one of your own. Now all you need to do this is VCV Rack and some form of MIDI controller or keyboard that you can control it with. So let's get started. Here is a very basic monophonic synthesizer. It's actually complete. It is a straightforward synthesizer. It's sort of like the type of synthesizer that Moog would build. It's got an oscillator, in this case actually two, it's got a filter, it's got an envelope, a VCA, and a MIDI to CV plugin that allows your MIDI keyboard or controller to talk to these parts of VCV. So let's look at each one individually. And I'm not going to get into all the deep technical stuff about how these things work. The point of this series is just to help you understand how things connect together and why they're used and how you can make your own choices based on what's available. So the first thing here is the MIDI to CV to be able to connect your keyboard or controller into VCV rack. And I'm using a Nectar Panorama P6 so I've chosen that in the MIDI interface dialog box here. Now the MIDI to CV can be found in the core folder of the plugins directory. So you would right click, go to core, and there is the MIDI to CV interface. And that's the one we're gonna start with today. So I've selected my MIDI interface, I've left channels at all, that's MIDI channels, and I'll come to that later. And then we've got these patch points. 
and they each help you connect features from your keyboard to VCV Rack. Now, the first module I've, I've used, and in this case, I'm using three modules from Volt's collection, and these are all free modules. This is the Vesic. It's a dual voice oscillator. It has two sounds at the same time. Sound one at the top, sound two at the bottom. And it has lots of modulation capabilities. What that means is things that can change the sound uh, inside the oscillator itself. Now this oscillator has three types of waveforms it generates. Pulse, saw and triangle and you select them here. You have a control for setting the octave of the sound for each waveform. You have a control for setting the tuning for each sound and you have a mix control that sets the balance between waveform 1 and waveform 2. And what I've done is I've taken the 1 volt per octave output from the MIDI to CV interface to the 1 volt per octave input on the VESIC. And what that means is when you play a note on your keyboard, each note sends a different value for the pitch. And this converts that MIDI note value to a voltage which represents the pitch that the VESIC is going to play whenever you press a note. Now, from there, I've taken the output, and this is actually the audio output from the VESIC to the input on a filter. Now, what a filter does is basically brighten and darken the sound. What it does is rolls off the frequencies. In this case, it's a low pass filter. So it, it rolls off the high frequencies the more that you close down the cutoff. So the lower this is set, in other words, to the left, the darker the sound will sound, the lower and deeper it will sound. The more to the right, the brighter it will sound because it lets through more frequencies. And in part, this subtraction of frequencies, in other words, fully open like this and then closing down the filter to this, that's what enables you to modify the tone, the sound coming from the oscillator. Then the next module I've got is an envelope. And I'm going to use slap here. It's a very simple envelope with four parameters. Attack, decay, sustain and release. And what an envelope does is shape the sound. So, for example, if you have a sound with no attack, zero attack, then when you press a key, the sound starts immediately, like pressing a key on a key on a organ. It literally starts immediately. It doesn't gradually get louder or gradually get brighter. It just starts full on straight away. The release part is the opposite of the attack. The more you set the release, when you release the key, the sound will die off straight away if it's set to zero, full to the left, again, just like an organ, or the more you turn it to the right, the release will decay away slowly. So it's like rings the sound. It lets it gradually die out instead of cutting off automatically. The sustain is the volume level or the brightness level or both of the sound when you're holding down the key. So after you've pressed it and you're holding it down, that's the level for that. And the decay is sort of in between the attack and the sustain. It determines the type of time it takes to go from when it's completed its attack and before it reaches the sustain level. 
So this sort of can modify that. And we'll come to that in a later episode. Now, the final component is a VCA. And typically that would be a separate module here. But the slap has a built-in VCA just here. So I don't need an extra module. I can use the one that's built in inside of slap itself. And the VCA is the volume control. So whereas the filter here controls the brightness and darkness, the VCA controls how quiet and how loud a sound can be. And in this case, the envelope, the shaper, is going to be shaping the volume and the brightness from the filter, filter at the same time. It's just so it keeps it simple for you so you can understand what's happening. So we've got the audio output coming from the VESIC going to the input of the filter. And then after it's gone through the filter, the audio output comes out of the filter and goes to the in on the VCA. Then from the out on the VCA, I've run a cord right up to my audio interface that connects with my speakers or my sound card or my headphones or whatever you're using. In actuality, in this case, I'm sending this up to a mixer and then from the mixer to the audio interface so I can set a stereo image if I wanted to pan it left or pan it right or keep it in the middle. And also I can easily add effects to the sound like delay or reverb. And I do that through the mixer. And again, we'll cover that in a different episode. Now, the last part of this chain is the gate. And here's the gate conversion. And what the gate is, is when you press a key, hold it and release it, that is what the gate handles, it interprets that. And this gate is being sent to the gate input of the envelope. So the envelope knows when I press a key, when I release a key, and when I hold a key down. And it, depending on what it does, you know, if I hit a key, then it looks at the attack and triggers the envelope. If I keep holding it down, it reaches the sustain and then holds that while I'm holding down the key. Then as soon as I release the key, it goes on to the release section of the envelope and lets the sound die off. So here is a basic synth and I'm going to play a few notes so you can hear what it sounds like. So that's just a very simple on-off sound, just like an organ, using the triangle wave on the oscillator. Now, if I change the triangle wave to a different waveform, we'll get a different basic sound. Here's the pulse. And if I open up the filter, it'll get brighter. If I open up more, it'll get even brighter. And if I close the filter, it will get dull. You can barely hear it. So that's the filter. Now I'm going to use the sawtooth for a different sort of sound. And again, if I open the cutoff, you'll hear more of it. And again, this is just a very simple on off sound. Now, the other thing I ought to mention is that this is a monophonic synthesizer. And what monophonic means 
it can only play one note at a time. Later on the series, I'll show you how to make a polyphonic synthesizer so you can play chords. But for the time being, and to keep things simple, this is a single voice monophonic synthesizer. Now, the next thing I want to do is change the two oscillators so we can combine different sounds together. So like, for example, a pulse wave on one and a triangle on the other. And this is what that would sound like. And I can change the balance here using the mix control between the pulse and the triangle. So you can determine how much triangle you can hear and how much pulse you can hear. The next thing is these two controls here, they determine how high in terms of octaves each of the, os the voices in the oscillator sound at. So at the moment they're playing the same note. But say I wanted the triangle to play deeper, lower than the oscillator, but still in tune with it, just an octave lower then you reduce this by one like this. And now you'll get a deeper sound from, from the triangle. That's with it down an octave. And that's with it the same octave. And that's with it up an octave. And you can add another one. Or take it down two. Earth rumbling that one. So that's the octave switches. And between these two octave switches and the waveforms here and the filter, you already should be able to get a variety of different sounds from this basic synthesizer. Now, there is a little trick I'm going to show you as well, and that is this button here. Here, there are tuning settings. Fine, coarse, and semi for each. I'll come to the lower two later on. But for now, the fine tune, if you add a small amount to one of the oscillators, like sort of literally a like about one o'clock at most, on the knob, then what happens is the two waveforms play at slightly different tuning and that thickens up the sound, makes it sound richer and you get this phasing effect going on that thickens up the sound. Um, I'll give you an example. See what I mean? It sort of like thickens the sound up, makes it sound richer, it sort of phases a little bit. It just adds a little to the tone. And you only need small amounts here. Now, the next thing I want to do is play with the cutoff. But I'm going to use the envelope to trigger the cutoff. So I need to make a shape in the envelope. So instead of just pressing the key and releasing it and the sound starting and stopping immediately, I want it to sound more like a piano keyboard where you press a key and release it and the sound of the strings rings on a little bit afterwards. So to do that, you use the release. So here is the sound as it happens with on off before I add any release. Now I'm going to add some release to it. That's with release. That's without. 
And yeah, there's a little bit of reverb on, on the uh, sound of the synth, just to give it a little bit of body. But that basically is cutting off straight away. So let's add a little bit more release. And it doesn't cut off straight away, it sort of fades the sound out. If I hold the note down, it is at full volume. And then I release the note and it fades out. And that, at the moment, is controlling the volume level. By default, that's what it does. But I also want it to control the filter. And by that I mean, when I release the note, I want the filter to close down, go darker. So to do that, we set a level for the filter and then this little knob here is an attenuator and you turn it to add more of the effect to the envelope. And that's that sort of typical, classic, plucky synth sound. And there you go. So playing with the cutoff here in this value, playing with the shape of the envelopes and playing with a few of the controls on here, and you've got a fully functioning synthesizer with a variety of different voices, sounds, type of sound, shape of sounds, something just to play with. And yeah, a lot of basic synths that you could and still can buy are fundamentally just this, nothing more. They basically have an oscillator, they have a filter, they have an envelope, they have a VCA, and they have a few other little things called like LFOs and such likes, but we'll come to them in the next episode. But for a basic synth voice, this is what they consist of. Okay, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. And we'll go to part two in the next episode of Talking Rackheads. Next, it's time to look at a new plugin from Vault. This one brings a bit of heat and fire to your rack. This is the new module from Vault. It's called The Flame, and it's an analog distortion model. It's not just one model of an analog distortion pedal, it's actually nine. What you have is three major models here, the rodent, the cylinder, and the blur, and then three sub-models for each one. The creme, the diez, and the puff. You then have a blend knob, which at full left position has no distortion, and at full right adds full distortion to the sound. You have a tone control, which doesn't just darken and brighten the sound, but adds a different sort of flavours to each of the models. And then you have the wonderfully named fuel control, which adds in depth, breadth, grunge, extra sort of really beef to each of the models. Each of these is modulatable via patch points and attenuators here. And... Notably, it's a stereo in and stereo out plug-in. Thank you, Leonardo, for that. So, that's really it. It's such a simple plug-in, but it's got a great set of distor distortion tones. So, what I'm going to do now is just play some short clips of me using the analog plug-in in different patches. And what each clip will consist of is hearing the sound or the mix without the distortion for a few seconds. And then I'll add the various distortion models in 
and maybe occasionally add some drums to it so you hear what the distortion sounds like within a mix. Okay, let's roll the first clip. Okay, so for this first patch, I'm using two flames, one for the lead sound and one for the bass sound with different models. And let's begin. And here is patch number two, again with two different models on the lead and the bass sound. Here's the third, and this time I'm using both flames to really change the sound coming from both the waves. patch I was just messing around for a, maybe an hour or so with flame just trying out all sorts of different things and playing with the 
Turing machine driving the waves and this little patch came up and I love this one so here we go So there you have it, the Flame by Vault, really, really good, comprehensive and well-modelled set of distortion pedals in VCV format. I really, really like this plugin. They're just, it's got some distortion sounds in it, and the detail in the modelling and the way it breaks up at times. Really wonderful work, Leonardo really top notch okay next on the list is now it's time to look at two new modules from developer as the original triggers module by freddy was one of my favorite utility modules it was basically made from two buttons one was a momentary button which means that when you press it, it does something and that's it. And one was a latch, which you press it and it holds at that point until you press it again and then it releases whatever it is that you told it to do. And they were great and I used them all the time. But the problem I got was I was using so many of them, it was hard to keep track of what did what. And so Freddie came up with this excellent update and produced two new Trigger modules, the Triggers Mark 1 and the Triggers Mark 2. Now the Mark 1 has a display that shows you the voltage that either the latch or the momentary is going to output when you press them. And you can change the voltage by rotating the volts knob. So now you can send a precise voltage when you hit the momentary or press the latch and this has got multitudes of possibilities for example i'm using it this large button here connected to the cv input of a turing machine so that when i press the latch button it locks the turing machine into its loop mode so i don't have to try and rotate that large knob in the middle of the Turing machine's front panel. Instead, I can just press this button and it instantly locks the loop in place. And then I press it again and it releases the lock. And that's really useful. You can also use it to send specific values to a module. So for example, I use this to send a specific value to a F35 filter. And that value changes the filter that's chosen for that particular piece of the song. So now I've got ways of instantly choosing different filters just by pressing buttons on one of the triggers. And that's really great. And all you do is you take the output from here and run a cable 
to the input of whatever it is you want the trigger to affect, be it the latch or the momentary. There's also an external input, so you could run a gate into this, for example, and when it receives a gate, it will turn on the latch and turn off. So you can actually automate this to send out the specific voltage that you want. Really nice. You can also link these up so one button can press four of these at times. So you could press, for example, three different momentaries like this and then have one button that presses all three for you at the same time. So it gives you that flexibility. Now the Mark II is made up of two momentary buttons, the top one and the bottom one. And the great thing about these is we now have labels. And labels means that you can automatically know what button does what because you can click on the little knob here and change the label from a long list of possibilities. And there's all sorts of useful things in this list. I mean, everything from resets to percussion instruments to whatever else. So, for example, in the patch I'm about to play a little clip from, this is the lead sound one, this is lead sound two, this is my kick, this is my snare, this is my hi-hat. This button here is resetting three BPM LFOs, and this one is freezing or pausing three BPM LFOs. And this bottom set is doing the same, but for a different set of three BPM LFOs. So let's just play a little bit with it and then you'll get an idea of how I use it. Here, we're gonna start with the bass part. And this bass part's being generated by a Turing machine and uh, the sound's being generated by the new XFX Wave. Now start off the kick. And I want to add some hi-hats. Now I'll add a snare. And now I'm ready to add lead one. Now I'm going to unlatch the loop of the Turing machine. And now I've latched it again. So it's now playing a new loop. Now I'm going to freeze the FX. And now I've reset them. Unfreeze the Turing machine. Now let them run. And that's it. Really simple little modules, but incredibly useful when you're trying to perform live. Thanks, Freddie. Really, really great updates to these plugins. Are there times when your muse leaves you and you find yourself lacking in inspiration when crea creating your next masterpiece? 
when you just want to make a really nice tune and you can't. Well, this is my favourite plugin of all time for helping me create something fresh and new. This is the Turing Machine. Now, I've used the Turing Machine for at least three or four years in my Euro rack. And when I saw that there was now a version of this by Stellare in VCV rack, I was thrilled to pieces because this is my inspiration machine. When I'm sitting there and I've got no idea about a new sequence or something, the Turing machine is my get out of jail free card every single time. What it does is generates a pattern, a series of random notes. And those notes play and constantly evolve and change all the time. But when you hear something that you really like, you can lock it into a loop. And then it loops round the last series of pitches and rhythms that you heard and remembers it and keeps it and loops it. And then you can jam with it or you can do what I do and that's record it straight out and then take that sequence and put it into a door and use it. And I would say that probably 60% of all the music that I created using my Eurorack was generated by the Turing machine in one shape or another because it does all sorts of tricks and things that you can use it for. It's not just for notes, for example. You can use it for rhythmic patterns to open and close gates or generate random clocks for your sequencer to give you interesting rhythms. Or you can use it to open and close and send random voltages to a filter. So you get that sort of, I don't know, Keith Emerson type bippy bloppy filter effect which is sort of really useful at times. So the Turing machine is this inspirational generator. It does things that you can't think of yourself, or you could, but it would take so long. And one other thing, this thing has got a mind of its own. Somehow or other, it comes up with things that are musical. And I have no idea how it does it but it's like every four or five seconds it comes up with something you go "Ooh, I like that and you lock it and you listen to it and it's like yeah that's really cool and there's no reason or rhyme to why it does that it just does it's just really really cool out the screen here now so you can see the Turing machine here in the top left hand corner and then the important bits of the patch that I'm using with this to demonstrate how it works. There are a few other things off screen that I'll cover in a little while. Okay, so the Turing machine. The center knob is the main control. And what this does is at the 12 o'clock position or close to it, the Turing machine generates a random stream of pitches. And it just keeps on generating them over and over and over. So if you leave it in the 12 o'clock position, you'll get just a constant stream of random pitches. And by default, these pitches are across a wide range of notes, octaves. Up, high, really low, in the middle. If you like that sci-fi blip blip sort of sound effects, that's what that can do. However, I want to do something a bit more musical so there is the scale knob and what the scale knob does it's an attenuator the more you turn it to the left the less of a range of notes the Turing machine will generate from its output here this is its volt per octave output so at about the say 10 o'clock position it generates notes over a range of about an octave and a bit the more to the left you turn it, 
the smaller the range becomes, the more to the right, the larger the range. If you turn it all the way to the left, it will only generate notes of one pitch, which can be used for sort of simple bass lines because this is not just generating pitches, it's also generating random rhythms. And I'll come to that in a moment. Now again, a tip for using this, take the output from the volt per octave output here and feed it into a quantizer. I'm using the quantum where I can select individual notes in a scale. So this prevents clashes of notes together. I've chosen notes which go well together when played in chords or in together in sequences. And I've got two of them, if you noticed, and I'll explain why in a second. But this is the one that I'm using from this output. The next thing is this center knob is sending out a stream of notes. And at the moment, the pattern length is set here. Now, what's the pattern length got to do with anything? If this is just a random st stream of notes? Well, this large knob, if you turn it to the left, it starts sort of going back in time. And it sounds really odd to say that. But it starts going in reverse the last set of steps that it generated. So, like, this is set for 12 steps. So the further to the left I go, it starts going backwards through the previous steps until it's full over to the left and it's playing the last 12 steps in reverse. Now, as you go forward, i.e. to the right from the 12 o'clock position, instead of playing a constant stream of new pitches, it starts to play less and less new ones for however many steps there are. So, for example, if I turn this to the 2 o'clock position, then every 12 steps, it will change maybe 10 of those steps, but keep two the same. If I go to the 3 o'clock position, it might change six of the steps, the pitches, but keep six the same. If I go to the 5 o'clock position, it may only change one or two of the steps every time it plays 12 steps it may play just two new ones and the remaining 10 stay the same as they were in the last loop round and eventually if you get to the full lock position then no notes are changed and that then loops the last number of steps and that number of steps again is set here so in full lock at the moment this would repeat the last 12 steps over and over again, giving you a loop of what it's done. Then the other part of this is this section here. These are random gates and triggers. And again, these are related to what's going on with the note sequence come from here. So I take, for example, a gate from port one and feed that to the gate in my envelope over here. And I've got two I'm using at the moment because I'm using two synths. One wave and second wave. And this wave is going to be playing what I'll call the lead line. And this one is going to be playing a bass line. And I'll get to where I get in the bass line from in a second. But this is generating the, the gates, the rhythms for each of these parts. And there are a number of these. So you've got lots of different choices of which one to use. One and two tend to generate the most gates. Not always, but the most. But all of these are actually related to each other. For example, this one here only triggers when both one and two light up at the same time. So this is sort of like a relationship between these two. And this one here is only triggers when gates two and four light up at the same time. And so on. Now, one trick that I use is I'll use a sequential eight to one switch. And what I'll do is I'll take 
eight different outputs from here and feed them to the eight outputs of the sequential switch. Then take one output from there and feed that to my gate. Now, when it's in full lock, it plays a rhythm. But if I change the switch, then I get different rhythms using the same notes because each one of these eight outputs is generating a different rhythm. So I may not care for the first one, but I might like the second one, or I might like the third, or I might like the combination of the first and the second together. It just depends on how it works. So it gives you a bit more variety to play with. On the right hand side, this is actually an entirely different sequencer. But what it generates is musically related to what the main sequencer is doing. So this sort of generates notes that are sort of fit in with what the main sequencer is doing. It's sort of like, it's really weird, it's like ESP. It, it sort of generates stuff that you go, oh, that's cool, because that works with the sequence that's running here. And its own output is here. And again, I fed that to its own quantizer. So the pitches stay within certain notes. And as it happens on this one, I've chosen the same notes for both quantizers. So both sequences will generate pitches utilizing the same notes, the same range of notes and the same notes. So they should musically go together quite well. But of course, you don't have to do that. And sometimes for a bass line, which is what I use this side for, I'll cut down the number of notes and only use maybe the root and the fourth and the fifth and sometimes the seventh. And here I'll let it run right across the entire chromatic scale or I'll just have major notes or I'll have a minor scale, something along those lines. So these two interact together. When you turn the knob on here, it changes the pattern on here. And these knobs, they sort of like additive. You just turn them and play with them and they change some of the pitches in the sequence. Um, it's really hard to explain in words. It's one of those things that if you play with it, you'll get it. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute. Then the other controls on here... This is a reset that I've run to my clock. So the reset on my BPM clock by AS. So that when I start the sequence, this starts in line with it and resets itself to go there. And then I've got a CV output, uh, sorry, CV input. And what that's used for is when you send a voltage to that, that controls the knob. And a useful little tip here is there's a new module out by AS shortly called Triggers Mark 1. Actually, there's two of them. I'll come to the second one in a moment. But Triggers Mark 1 has a latch switch and a voltage display. And if you send 10 volts to the CV here, it automatically locks this into the loop mode. So rather than trying to turn the knob quickly to get the loop, when you hear it, you go, oh, that was cool. I want to save that loop. You just press this big button here and it locks it in place until you press it again and then it will go back to its previous setting. So this is like a quick lock in loop position. And this one here is a momentary version of the same switch. This is a latch, so it holds it in position. This one's a temporary switch. And then finally, I've got my clock input from here. And this can come from your favorite clock. You can also feed it random gates with random rhythms. And this will follow those random rhythms. So it doesn't have to be a steady clock. It can be a clock with all sorts of weird rhythms to it and stuttering and all sorts of things. And it will follow that and generate patterns based on that rhythm. Finally, there are these little buttons here. The first one writes a single pitch into each of the number of steps. And the more you click it, the more it fills up with the same pitch. And the zero one 
deletes the pitch from the step, so it removes steps, pitch steps from the sequence. And if you're in the lock position, you can thin out the sequence or add notes to the sequence using these two buttons. And then this one rotates the sequence within the lock step. So if I press this one and say the first note of the sequence was a C, if I press the right hand button, the C will become the second note of the sequence. And the 12th step, because I'm in 12 step mode, the pitch that was on the 12th step will become the first, and so on. And if I press this button, it goes in reverse. It rotates the sequence backwards. So you can use these two buttons to go forwards and backwards. And again, there's a CV input here that you can utilize a large button to go forwards and backwards in the sequence. Again, to give more variety. Now, remember what I said. All this stuff is sort of interrelated to each other. And that's what makes this special, because when it creates new patterns and riffs and things, everything it's doing is interrelated. So it sort of it does a magic trick and it all fits together. And typically what happens is every five or six seconds, it generates this new little sequence that I've never thought of or heard of before with different rhythms and different pitches and and the this one here generating pitches and rhythms to relate to this one. And you can create these amazing little sequences, as I was explaining earlier. This really is my inspiration machine. And with these few little settings of the scale and using quantizers, it becomes very musical in its output. And that's the key making it musical. Now, that was a lot of talking, but there's a lot to explain in order for you to understand how this is all going to work. So now let's start listening to the sort of thing it can produce. So earlier, I was just playing around with it for a couple of minutes, and it came up with this little sequence, very simple little sequence, and this is what it sounds like. So that's the basic little simple sequence, really simple. And it just came up. Then I thought, oh, that's interesting. Now, one of the tricks that I've used here is, as I said, I've used a 12 step pattern, but I've also got a 16 step drum pattern that's playing on a pulse matrix off screen. And these buttons here will allow me to turn it off. And these are the new Mark II triggers. So yes, you can now label what each button's doing. So this one mutes and unmutes the kick drum, and this one mutes and unmutes the snare, and this one the hi-hat. And these two are turning on and off and also synchronizing some off-screen BPM LFOs by Frozen Wastelands. And they're great LFOs. I mean, I'm using them all the time now because they synchronize with the clocks from your master clock. So you get musical sweeps of filters and modulations and you can change the way they interact with each other and yet still recall it because you just feed in the same clock ratios and they produce the same effects. And what I'm using those for is the modulation uh, for the waves. I'm using the position of the waveform and then two mods. And I'm using LFOs, three for each which each of these buttons control all three to change and modulate through the waveforms and so on. So this here, this lead one part, that's a six, a 12 step sequence looping. And I pressed the latch button when I heard it. That's why it's bright red, because really this switch is now full over in full hard over in the lock loop position. So it's repeating the same steps, same 12 steps over and over. Now I'm going to add in uh, the kick drum. So you get an idea of how the two are relating, the drum pattern and the lead sound. So 
a sort of nice synchronized, sorry, a nice uh, sort of desynchronized part. It's sort of off tempo a little bit, but it fits, it works. Now, the one thing I don't know is what this sequencer has generated. I genuinely haven't listened to what this has done. This is going to be a surprise for me and you. But as I said, typically, whatever these are set to, this sequencer will produce a musical output that's related in some way to this. So it'll be interesting to see what it's turned out. And what I've done is I've taken this sequencer and fed it to the second wave down here and I've set this up to play a bass sound. So I've got a lead sound here and a bass sound here. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the two will be related in some way so they'll sound musically interesting together. Hopefully. Sometimes it doesn't work, but let's hope it does this time. So here's the lead sound, then I'll put the kick back in and then I'll start the so-called bass line off and we'll see what happens. <laughs> little sequence and I would record the outputs from both oscillators and make a little wave file and then I've got that to use in my door later on or or I can sort of write down the notes or transfer the notes by ear to a real sequencer to play back that rhythm and pattern later but now we've got to play with it and this is the moment of truth what are the things is it's going to come up with so let's find out Okay, so I'm going to unlatch from the loop and let it start creating something new. Now I just looped it again and we've got a different pattern. Unloop it. And I've just latched it again, and another sequence has appeared. take these knobs and see what relatable differences they make. Thank you. 
I'm just playing with them just to see what I get out of it. Oh, that's interesting. Let's see what that sounds like with the lead line. That's what I mean by it sort of comes up with sort of different ideas of inspiration. And I can play with this for hours and come up with all sorts of different things. Different sounds, different rhythms, different pitches, sequences, add different notes to the, the uh, quantizer to get different types of musical information coming out of them. It's an endless supply. And to be honest, anybody can do it. You don't need to have a musical ear you can just set these up like this and it will generate musical sounding sequences. And that's really cool about it. Finally, play with the length of the steps because that can make a big difference to the output too. I'm just going to play a little bit more and just show you what I mean and you'll get what I'm talking about. Now repeating a six step loop. Now go to an eight step. Now go to sixteen. Go back to the 12. Yeah, that's cool. I like that one. So they have it. The Turing machine. Your inspiration for your sequences. Got any questions? Leave them in the comments. It's a great little device and uh, Stellar did a tremendous job at the port from the hardware to the software. I mean it really just works the same as far as I can tell uh, and I've used the hardware for three years and I don't see any difference between this and the hardware version at all. It's a brilliant little port. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, on with the next thing. So, that's a wrap for episode two of Talking Rackheads. I hope you found it enjoyable and found some parts of it interesting. If you've got any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments below. And I would really appreciate it, as feedback's very important. Also, Thank you to everybody who helped out this week. Um, there's too many to name here. You'll all be in the end credits anyway. But just a big thank you to everybody who helped me uh, with my questions about FCPX and editing. And I hope the quality of this video was a little better than last time. And hopefully next week it'll be a little better than this. About three years ago, a trailer was made for the PC game Star Citizen and the music that was used underneath it was written by Fotales and it was called Atlas. And at the time I was contacted and asked if I would work on an orchestral version of Atlas, which I did and it turned out pretty good if I say so myself. And I was sitting here thinking, what will I do for the playout music? for this week 
and it dawned on me, why not try and do a VCV rack version of the orchestral version of Fotail's Atlas? So I did. Now, what you'll see on screen is basically the whole patch. There's a few modules off screen that I can't show you quite yet, maybe in the next couple of weeks. But basically, everything you see and hear is done in VCV Rack. There's a sample player off screen playing a few cymbal crashes and a couple of very short drum loops, but that's it. Everything you see and hear is done within VCV Rack itself. And thanks so much to Jason at Trowersoft for his amazing Vault Seek and Trig Seek sequences, because without them, I could never have done this. Their ability to chain patterns of sequences means that I could utilize 250 step sequences, multiples of those, throughout this piece to be able to perform it live, as I'm going to do now in this video. Thanks, guys. Have a great week and see you next Wednesday.